For many of us, the dream job becomes unattainable when life happens. For others though, the dream job becomes their life itself. And this week we're going to meet a young man who has attained it. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Anur the Light. Masood Sadula has found a job where he doesn't have to work a day in his life. From early morning to late at night, he's able to indulge in his passion, which is to serve. In so doing, the boy from Rondebosch East in Cape Town has gone on to be named the world's top hotel concierge and been inducted into an elite group of hotel concierges. The role of a concierge is basically to take care of all the guest needs whilst they're staying with us. So this can be done prior to them staying at the hotel via email or telephone. But we basically, you know, book all their restaurants, all their touring, um, anything that is available to experience in Cape Town, we put that together. And with our local knowledge, we ensure that they get the best experience by going to the finest restaurants, um, you know, going to, uh, you know, all the little hidden gems in Cape Town, and that's what makes a, a, a concierge. Masood received the, the, the Concierge of the Year uh, in, our, uh, in London during our annual uh, staff appreciation party, and Mrs. Tolman, our, our, our founder and president, um, bestowed that award on him for all the hard work and the, de the dedication that he gives. You know, there's very few guests around our hotel that wouldn't very fondly talk about Masood and what he's done and his dedication to make their stay the most memorable that they've ever experienced. Masood loves working with people and is always keen to lend a helping hand, but being a hotel concierge has never been his first choice in life. Although he had other dreams, he's ever grateful for ending up where he is. I used to work in a surf store uh, in actual fact when I was in Madrid and I enjoyed, I loved working with people. You know, I used to love helping customers, whether it may be with flip-flops or wetsuits. And uh, from there, I just decided that, uh, you know, this is something I wanted to, you know, progress in my career. And it was either between that, uh, between hospitality or uh, travel and tourism. But I chose hospitality and uh, I began to study hotel management and then worked my way through, you know, the, the various front office departments. And I was actually given an opportunity to work as a concierge. So that's how I realized um, being a concierge was definitely what I wanted to do. For him, it's really personal. He wants to ensure that those people come back. And that's the true, true, true value of Masood. One of our, our, our mission statements in, in our company is no request too large, no detail too small. Now, if you had to put a phrase to a person, that would be Masood. A lot of times we find that guests, when they get to the hotel, go, where's Masood? I need to speak to Masood. He's helped me so much already. It feels that we've been long lost friends. For many, many years, I've not even met him before. For this young concierge and his family, the highlight of his career was having a royal invitation extended to him by the Saudi royal family after their stay at the hotel in 2012. Sadula and his mother Fairuz were granted the opportunity to make their pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, paid for by the royal family. As you know, with Saudi, it's very difficult to get visas, but my mother and I got a royal invitation via the Saudi embassy. And, you know, they, they pretty much paid for every single thing. And it was the most incredible experience, you know, to go with my mother on Hajj was such an honor. Um, to stand with my mother on Arfa was probably the proudest moment of my life. What I thought about at the time was, you know, all I did was just be myself and show these guests that I love what I do. You know, and for me to, to achieve a spiritual dream and my mother's spiritual dream, to make that dream a reality by doing what I love doing, really, um, I knew that, you know, that this was a blessing from the Almighty. The perks of the job are many, but Masood has to remain on top of his game. It helps that he's from Cape Town and can point guests in the right direction, but he also ensures he checks out many of the places and is often a tourist in his own hometown. When the helicopter lands here, um, 
you know, sometimes I take a flight, uh, you know, depending on if it's quiet enough. Sometimes we send other staff members on the helicopter flight because, you know, it's not just myself uh, that needs the job knowledge and experience and the perks. It's also my colleagues. You know, the more I empower them and the more I teach them and the more they learn, the more confident they are in their jobs. Because at the end of the day, you know, I cannot achieve anything without my team. You know, uh, not only my department, but in the entire hotel. You know, we have to all work hard for each other and uh, work together to ensure that our guests are happy. And I think that's the most important aspect of being a successful hotel. Masood continues to encourage others to dream big and never give up. For this successful Muslim, being a concierge is not only a job, but a beautiful lifestyle, and one that he remains committed to. It's that time of the month where we are joined by life coach, Sister Nariman Richards. Assalamu alaikum, Nariman, and how are you? Wa alaikum salam, Mariam. I'm very well. Alhamdulillah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, shukran. Today's topic looks at the conflict between personal values and corporate practices. Tell us more about it. Yes, Mariam, the corporate monster. You know, um, viewers will, who are in the corporate world will identify with this. Um, I think that um, at some stage when you're in corporate, you do struggle when your personal values um, are not aligned with corporate policy or corporate values. So what happens when your personal values are in conflict with your corporate practices and policies? I think that, you know, when clients come to me, when they're struggling in their jobs, um, initially you, you think or you believe that there's someone in the organization or that you're not getting along with or there's something that you're not happy with. But when we unpack it, we, re we most times we realize, or the client realizes that at the core, their personal values is directly in conflict with um, the organization's values and policies and practices. And so this creates an internal struggle. And if they don't recognize it, the struggle could get really out of hand and you could be reaching out or to others to try and get them to change the way they're doing things. And you know, I mean, if, if you've been corporate, you'll know that um, it can get quite nasty. So coming to a life coach and actually unpacking that will give you an opportunity to recognize that. And how do we address our concerns with the key role players in the organization? That's a difficult one because um, nine out of 10 times, the role players are obviously our superiors. So the struggle is to be real and authentic in, and have really difficult conversations. Um, it takes a certain level of maturity to do that. Um, and it also takes a certain level of honesty, firstly with yourself, to um, be honest about is this organization um, or company um, a place that I want to be? And, and then have those conversations from a mature level. So what are the skills we need to learn to tame the monster instead of trying to destroy it, or better still letting it try to destroy us? I think the most important skill or the most important thing to learn to do is to not take it personal, to recognize that your values are personal to you and the company values are what um, drives the company. And so recognize that, it's, that if there's a misalignment, there's always going to be conflict. Um, and this doesn't only apply in conflict in the situation, I think even in other relationships, a lot of times we don't identify that why our relationships are not working is because at the core, our personal values are so different. Ah, understood. Nariman, shukran so much for sharing your knowledge with us. This will definitely help guide those people who are struggling to deal with this topic. Afwan and uh, shukran for having me on the show today. Next up, we're off to Durban, where we got to find out more about the care and maintenance of the Sufi shrines.
The Sufi mosque and shrine on the hill in Riverside, Durban, is a well-known landmark and is testament to the legacy of the man who built it, Hazrat Sufi Saab. This shrine pays homage to a great scholar of Islam, and his gravesite, which can be found inside, receives visitors from far and wide. It has become a place of solace as well as reflection for those who visit, and people can often be found reciting from the Holy Quran. These institutions, these mazarat, the, the place of tranquility is home and to all schools of thought, is open to all denominations, all communities, all minorities and majority population of South Africa in which they come on daily basis to seek peace, tranquility, advice, help, assistance when they are caught up in their lives and they're caught up either in financial troubles, spiritual troubles, they come to this institution and being a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the noble prophet Muhammad peace be upon him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that the resting place of the friends of Allah are garnered from the gardens of paradise where the mercy of Allah descends 24-7. So this uh, institution of Hazrat Sahib has played a legacy for over 124 years of service and it was instrumental in bringing Islam to KwaZulu Natal and is still up to this very day plays a pivotal role in being one of the headquarters of the Muslim heritage culture and service to humanity in this part of South Africa. Hazrat Sufi Saab Radhi Alay is known to be the first Sufi master in Durban. He is a direct descendant of Sayyidina Hazrat Abu Bakr Sadiq Radi Alay, the first Caliph of Islam and the father-in-law of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Sufi Saab arrived from India in 1895 and played a significant role in the Muslim community of Durban. The Sufi Saab, rahmatullahi ta'ala, his contribution to Islam is a great one. If you look at his achievements, from 1895, to 1911, in which he passed away, he established 12 institutions, compromising of 12 masajids, 14 madaris, constituting of orphanages, old age homes, social welfare centers, rehabilitation centers, uh, soup kitchens, graveyards, Islamic graveyards and kabbalistans, and an institution where people could come and receive spiritual guidance, as well as physical and medical assistance as well. So from 1904 to 1911, in a space of seven years, the other 11 Sufi institutions were established, and this reflects on the great contribution and the miraculous nature and sainthood of this beloved son of Islam. It was Hazrat Sheikh Ahmed Bacha Pir who first predicted the arrival of Sufi Saab. Bacha Pir arrived in Durban as an ordinary indentured laborer and was known to be a holy Muslim man with spiritual powers. Soon after his death, Sufi Saab located the grave of Bacha Pir at the Brook Street Cemetery and erected a shelter over his grave, making the community aware about the greatness of Saint Bacha Pir. Today, his grave is a mystical heritage site in Durban. Hazrat Bacha Pir was part of the 1860 indentured laborers who came from Calcutta, India, to work on the sugarcane plantation in KwaZulu Natal. Hazrat Basha Peer immediately showed his powers of God, Almighty Allah, and he was relieved from his position. He is to be stationed at the back of this mosque, and he is to stay here. And in 1892, close to 1893, he passed away in this mosque on a Friday. So his shrine, which is 400 yards from here, was then located by Hazrat Sufi Saab, who arrived in 1895 to locate his grave. The history of Sufi Saab will speak that the spread of Islam was responsible because of the arrival of Hazrat Basha Peer and the arrival of Hazrat Sufi Saab. The descendants of Hazrat Sufi Saab has taken to maintain and care for the shrines. The community generously donates funds for this and the buildings are well looked after. Plans are in place to open a school and madrasa for learners at the Kenville Shrine. Classes will cater from preschool to eventually matric. Under our key, which is the Habibia Suisa Pasha Trust, there are two mazarat which we are responsible for. This is the mazarat of Hazrat Suwisa, Ibrahimatullahi Ta'ala Ali, and his beloved mother. 
and we're also responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the Mazar in 20 Bashapir Square, which is the Mazar Sharif of His Eminence, Sheikh Ahmad Bashapir Al Qadri, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ali, for which we are also responsible for the maintenance and the khidmah and the service of that shrine as well. We have been brought uh, and born into the service of humanity, servitude to the public, and Alhamdulillah, we could have gone in other venues, but we found ourselves day to day as we are born and we spend each minute in this institution love and a passion for service to humanity and service to the community uh, is in our dna in our blood so alhamdulillah by the grace of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't only find it as our job we, it's a passion it's a calling and uh, alhamdulillah we love it and each and every day brings about a new experience these shrines represent a history of Muslim life in Durban, as well as commemorating the life of Hazrat Sufi Saab and others. Their care and maintenance are of utmost importance, and the Sufi family should be commended for taking this upon themselves. Port Elizabeth is another local favorite destination for travelers, and we went to find out what adventures await the Muslim visitor. Animals are very much a part of living in South Africa. People often travel here to marvel at some of nature's most feared predators. And for the visitor in Port Elizabeth, there's definitely some good places to see them. We have um, a black leopard as well as an ordinary one. We have white lions as well as uh, tawny lions. We have um, the Siberian tigers are the biggest of the species of tigers. We have Bengal, a white one, a very rare golden Bengal. And uh, so we have animals that the people wouldn't easily see elsewhere. We have other animals free roaming like giraffe and zebra, the libis, other buck. The Predator Park is privately run and visitors have the time to interact as well as get up and close to these beautiful creatures. The admission costs help feed the animals as well as keep the park open. 70 rand for an adult and 30 rand for a child and then everything is in, in the park is for free. So they can bry and picnic, they can ask someone to show them, tell them about animals, they can uh, make the most of being absolutely out without anything else around and just the noise of the animals. This is definitely one of those must-see places and the park is only a short distance from the Port Elizabeth city centre. It's a fun and educating trip for the whole family. Curries are very much a staple food in South Africa and while there are many restaurants and cafes serving it, few get the authenticity of the dish just right. There is however a place in Port Elizabeth where visitors will find a great curry dish. Hungry Peter is, uh, is an Indian cuisine. It's, we sell all authentic Indian food. It was started by my dad and me myself. My father is a fifth generation chef in the family and I'm the sixth generation in the family. We were born in India and brought up uh, in India and we started working here. So we, my dad has opened quite a few Indian restaurants in Joburg and all over. I was also working as an Indian chef and eventually we started that, we thought that we must start a small little hub of our own and we did it. George's love for food was inculcated from a young age as it comes from a long line of chefs. His hands-on approach ensures the food is both fresh and made to the client's taste. Our signature dishes is, uh, is mutton rogan josh, butter chicken, and our bunny chows is very popular, especially our curry as well. We give an option of mild, medium, medium and hot. We give uh, value for money. Our food comes with a portion of rice. It's a full meal with everything getting expensive. I think we give a very good uh, bargain at the price. The quality is very good. We use a lot of cashew nut paste and uh, stuff in that. We keep it rich and nice. And yeah, it's a, value and it's a family meal, full and affordable. The cafe is known for its divine food and has built up a regular clientele. The love of Indian food is satisfied with George's tasty curries. The Sunday's River just outside Port Elizabeth is known as an outdoor lover's paradise. There are many activities one can participate in, but one of the most fun has got to be sandboarding. 
Sandboarding here is uh, quite unique because we, um, we have to get you on a boat and uh, it's a really beautiful area and we're only five kilometers from the Addo Elephant National Park. We teach everyone how to do it and what to do. Um, if they don't get it, they can always lie on a board or sit on a board, but within half an hour, everyone is actually standing on the boards and enjoying it. Guides are on hand to teach the basics, and from then on, it's up to you to get your board on. I would recommend this for anyone because um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, as soon as people try it, then they, they, they see that they can do it. It's not that difficult. You get the ones you can lie on. Um, those are like for beginners and people who don't really want to stand up on boards. So yeah, you can lie or sit on the boards and you can stand up the same as snowboarding. So yeah, people, um, people like to try all three different ways of sandboarding. This is definitely some of the best fun to be had in the friendly city, but bookings are essential. Only a limited amount of people get to make the trip daily, and all gear is provided. Ramadan has come, and it's just about out. As I do every year, I'd like to urge my fellow Muslims to not let go of the spirit of this month. Our souls have been fed abundantly, so let us make sure we take care of it by living the best life we can. Jazakallah khair for tuning in. Until next week, I'm Mari Mukwanda. Salam hantle, assalamu alaikum. Ramadan is flying away. Fingers counting down the days, but we feel that great things are coming. We know this is a special night where angels come from up high, and there's peace on earth as in heaven. One night like a thousand months of blessings all at once. I know that when it comes, I'll pray. Can't you be 